Anyone? I see we're live now, it looks like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's virtual field trip to Palm Beach County's Mounts Botanical Garden, where our topic of exploration is when art meets science. Today's live stream event is brought to you by the Scientists in Every Florida School program and Mounts Botanical Garden. Scientists in Every Florida School is a free program housed within the Thompson Earth Systems Institute at the University of Florida. The CEFS program connects and builds long-term relationships between teachers and scientists in order to bring current scientific research and big data into classrooms across Florida. Mounts Botanical Garden is a nationally acclaimed attraction for Florida residents and visitors alike with a mission to inspire and educate through nature. Today, you will be joined by Dr. David Blackburn, the curator of herpetology from the Florida Museum of Natural History, in order to take a virtual field trip of an unfroggettable array of frog sculptures on display called Ribbit the Exhibit at Mounts. Be sure to type any frog-related questions for Dr. Blackburn in the chat box. We'd like to um, first start by setting the stage for today's virtual field trip. And you can go ahead and proceed to the next slide. So Mouse Botanical Gardens is a 14 acre uh, facility. It's got 25 unique garden areas and thousands of plant species. There's yearly art installations on uh, campus. Today, we're going to look at Ribbit the Exhibit. This unique frog exhibit, frog-based exhibit uh, housed at the museum or at the at the garden will uh, take you through a wonderful display. Next. It was created by the couple, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Cobb that you see here. Next. And it was inspired by Wind and the Willows, a very famous children's story. The artists make all of the sculptures out of copper sheeting and they weld those uh, sheets together to build the great displays that you're going to see. There's some inspiration from some very famous art artists like the Little Dancer sculpture by Edgar Degas, as well as Diana, the Huntress. And without any further ado, what we'd like to do right now is have Dr. Blackburn take you on the tour. All right, great. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, begin with just telling you a little bit about myself before kind of delving into uh, the tour of uh, these, these great frog sculptures and telling you a little bit about frog biology as we do that. Um, so first, just uh, to give you an idea of who I am, I'm a scientist at the University of Florida's Florida Museum of Natural History. I study uh, mostly, for the most part, frog diversity and evolution and conservation. Uh, we work a lot in tropical Africa. We also work with anatomy, with fossils. We do a lot of various different types of projects about the biology of frogs around the world. Uh, this is my lab. We have a, a large group of people. They're diverse. Uh, we have a lot of different interests, um, people from all around the world. And so uh, all of this group, for the most part, works on frogs. But you'll notice there's some snakes and even crocodiles in this of the types of projects that happen in my lab. Um, in, in addition to my responsibilities as a faculty member at UF, I also oversee uh, the scientific collections that relate to amphibians and reptiles. So the study of amphibians and reptiles is herpetology. Um, and the, the museum has one of the world's, in the United States, one of the 10 largest collections of amphibian and reptiles. Um, these come from around the world and are used in research um, and also in teaching at the University of Florida and include some of the world's largest collections of skeletons of amphibians and reptiles, crocodiles, and turtles. And so part of our job here at the museum is, you know, facilitating the use of this work, um, the use of this stuff by students and scientists all around the world. Sometimes people come to the museum, sometimes we send it to other people on the other side of the world. Um, so today we're going to be taking this tour through the uh, Mons Botanical uh, Gardens to look at all of these uh, these great bronze uh, copper sculptures. And we're going to begin here with uh, Bentley the frog uh, riding his uh, pet turtle Tortuga. And so uh, you know this is a, I began with this because this is a great example of an amphibian and a reptile. Uh, and so those are part of sort of the domains of things that we normally uh, study in our lab. Just to remind everybody the difference between these. So frogs and toads, that's one group of things. Those are um, 
frogs and toads are sort of one group of amphibians. Another group are salamanders and newts. And these are on the top. And on the far right on the top, you'll see a worm-like, snake-like thing. That's called a Sicilian. That's another group of amphibians. On the bottom are all the things that are not amphibians, but sometimes get confused by people. That includes things that are snakes, lizards, crocodiles, turtles. Um, and just to put uh, make clear in people's minds, just because there's an animal that goes onto water and to land, that does make it amphibious, but it is not an amphibian. Uh, and so yes, crocodiles are amphibious because they go on land and water, um, but they are not an amphibian. Um, and so those amphibians are the things on the top, frogs and salamanders. Uh, and Sicilians. Uh, it turns out there's an awful lot of these species, often more than people expect. Um, this is a, a really exciting time to be a frog biologist because we are discovering new species all the time, as I'll show in a moment. Um, and if you, if you counted them all up, the vast majority of the world's amphibians are frogs. And at this point, there's more than 7,000 kinds of frogs. So I think there's only about 20 to 30 sculptures in this exhibit, uh, but there are an awful lot of frog species out there in the world. Uh, and last, just to make the point, um, this is a really exciting time uh, for frog biology. Um, on average, we discover about 100 to 150 new species of amphibians, most of which are frogs, every year. Um, and actually, I had to update this slide from yesterday because there was a new one added to our database yesterday that was described yesterday. So, you know, we're constantly discovering new species, um, things that are new to science. And every one of those is not just a name on a list, but it's exciting opportunities to learn more about the biology of frogs, um, which we'll be showing some examples of here today. Um, just yeah, for those of you, many of you are probably in Florida. Florida has 28 native species of frogs. Um, and we do have a few established invasive species. Probably the ones that get the most attention are the bottom two. The bottom left is a Cuban tree frog and the bottom right is a cane toad. Especially if you're in South Florida, these may look pretty familiar to you. So let's move on to another sculpture. This is the sculpture that uh, greets you as you enter the exhibit. This is Clyde. Um, and, I, and I picked this one to begin here because Clyde is waving at you um, with all of his beautiful fingers, which we'll come back to in a moment. Um, so frogs, frogs have a really interesting uh, skeleton and anatomy relative to all these other vertebrates that you see, right? So we have a little over 30 vertebrae in our body. Uh, frogs have an incredibly short um, uh, vertebral column. So they don't have many vertebrae. They, on average, have about nine to 10, depending on the species, vertebrae um, in their body. So they have these tiny little trunks, right? But they, they have these huge legs. So if you, if you had to think about the, the size of their legs relative uh, to their vertebral column, think just looking at this picture, how big your legs would have to be in order to be that large, right? You'd have a thigh bone that was much larger than your entire vertebral column going, your backbone going down your back. So they have these massively large legs, which of course are used for propelling themselves through the air when they, they jump. Um, some other fun facts about frogs that sometimes people don't know. So no frogs except one uh, have teeth on their lower jaw. So all frogs lack teeth on their lower jaw. And in fact, many, teeth, uh, many frogs lack teeth altogether. So toads, for instance, toads don't have teeth. Uh, for those of you that live in Florida, there's a frog that you'll hear go, Aah. those are little narrow mouth toads that live in the grass. Uh, none of those frogs have teeth. So losing teeth is very common in frogs. Um, and, they, and they don't necessarily need them for capturing prey when they're biting things. Um, we already talked about their large legs. And the other reason I, I use this with Clyde here is that uh, frogs actually only have four fingers. And if, uh, if you hang out with uh, me and my children, you'll notice that every time I watch a show that happens to have a frog involved, we have to freeze the frame to count the fingers on the frog to see if they got it right. Um, and unfortunately, you know, in this case, frog uh, Clyde, the greeter, has five fingers, not four, as a true frog would. However, you know, Clyde is in really good company. It turns out there's a lot of very famous frogs that uh, it seems have five fingers. And I think if you're in a movie, you often have to have five fingers to operate all the things that frogs are doing in these shows. Um, frogs come in all shapes and sizes. These are sort of typical looking types of frogs. They're actually really distantly related to each other on different sides of the world. So this is the froggy frog that uh, most people think of when they think of a frog. But frogs come in all weird varieties, right? So the ones on the left here, all the pointy headed ones, these tend to be things that specialize on eating ants. A lot of times these burrow underground. Uh, the ones on the right are things that tend to specialize on really big things. So they'll eat other vertebrates, they'll eat mice. If a bird is dumb enough to get caught by a frog, these frogs will eat them. They eat really big things. So they have these massive heads. 
Um, and just to give you a full sense of the range of ways of being a frog on the left is the tiniest frog in the world. It's about the size of my pinky fingernail. Um, these are some of the dwarf frogs of Papua New Guinea. And on the right is the world's largest frog. This is the Goliath frog of Central Africa and Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea. Um, these can be about the size of, you know, a newborn baby, a big newborn baby uh, for a human. All right, let's talk about things that frogs do. Um, frogs do, in fact, make music. Uh, and this is often one of the things that, uh, you know, people will mention uh, if, if you ask people just in the general public about, you know, what do frogs do? Making noise is one of them. Now, they don't necessarily play brass instruments, but they do make a really wide range of sounds. And I'm gonna give you a few examples here. So uh, one will begin. You go to Costa Rica, uh, you will hear this frog. I, I promise you, this is the strawberry dark frog, sometimes called the blue jeans frog. Um, another one that's a type of noise that you might hear that's very common in the United States are toads. Toads tend to do things that are trills and they can last a very long time. Probably many of you have heard trills. Um, and if you go into the Caribbean, especially the island of Puerto Rico, um, actually in Hawaii, where they're also invasive, you might hear these. These are the coquis. But these are coquis, which are some of the, uh, the treasure of the island of Puerto Rico, um, called coquis because of the noise that they, they make. And so frogs make a wide variety of noises. The things to remember here is that it's only the boys, the only the males that are actually making noise. These are advertisement calls. So they tend, sometimes we tend to think of them like this toad sitting in the pond advertising themselves so that female frogs will find them. Um, but a lot of times, you know, there's frogs that can mate in all sorts of other weird places. The coquille frog on the right actually doesn't even have tadpoles. And so it may call from bushes and anywhere, um, anywhere where they can find places that are moist enough to basically lay their eggs um, and keep them, keep them from drying out, right? So they, these little tiny eggs hatch out as tiny baby frogs. Um, so we have these advertisement calls from male frogs that you can find really, you know, all around the world, uh, people are familiar with listening to frog calls. Now, another a couple statues that you see um, in the exhibit are some of these really great sculptures of dancers. There's Sasha the Dancer, uh, inspired by the Degas sculpture that we talked about earlier. There's also Floyd and Grace, who are, I think, uh, inspired by uh, uh, Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. And it turns out there's also frogs that dance, which is often uh, sort of underappreciated. Um, just to give you an example. And, and actually dancing, it's not really dancing, but it's a way of making yourself known to other frogs, um, not just by making noise. So this is actually something that's evolved a couple different times independently in frogs. So on the left, you see some of the dancing frogs of India from the mountains of Western India. And on the right here, we're gonna show a, another one. So these are frogs that actually often live in bat and environments where there's a lot of noise, right? There's so much noise in these really uh, fast moving streams that it might make yourself hard to be heard. So a lot of times in these, uh, in some of these really loud stream environments, these frogs still call often, but during the day especially, and you'll see on the frog that we saw on the right, how the webbing between its toes is actually white, right? And so they actually have these visual signals for communicating to other frogs as well. Now, um, another common thing that you might know about frogs is that they are, of course, not only amphibians, but they are amphibious. So they go between the land and the water. So Scully the scuba frog here is prepared to, uh, to make the journey from land into water. And of course, frogs actually don't need to suit up to go in the water, right? They're perfectly at home in the water. Um, and one of the things that's actually um, probably most familiar to people about a, a sort of a water to land part of their life is the fact that they, they go through metamorphosis, right? So in frogs um, and in, in most amphibians, uh, this is an example on the top of a cane toad, so actually the invasive species we have in Florida, and on the bottom a type of salamander. So common to both frogs and salamanders and even some Sicilians is that they lay their eggs uh, in water, the, the eggs hatch in the water, they hatch out as what we call a larva. In frogs, we tend to call them a tadpole. And you can, we'll, we'll show frog tadpoles here in a moment. 
But if you look on the top and the, compare the top middle and the bottom middle, you'll notice that the sort of aquatic, the, the phase of its life that lives in the water looks pretty different between a salamander and a frog because frogs have these really weirdly specialized uh, early parts of their life that are tadpoles, right? And we'll look at a tadpole in detail in a second. And of course, then they metamorphose. Some frogs metamorphose and actually still live in and around the water. Other frogs metamorphose, they change their body shape and actually become an adult frog and they spend a lot of their life on land, maybe only returning to water to mate and lay eggs. So let's look at tadpoles. Probably many people have not thought about what a tadpole looks like in any detail. Uh, tadpoles are remarkably weird little animals. So they have these tiny little bodies. They have this large tail. They have an incredibly tiny mouth. Um, and in that mouth are, is a little beak. In the, it's a beak made of keratin, sort of the same type of stuff you might find in your fingernail. And they have little tiny black things that are, they're not really teeth, but they're basically made of keratin. They're tooth-like structures. And they use these little mouths for going along and grazing, grazing on you know, algae, things growing on rocks, um, things that are like leaves that are falling apart. They're eating all that type of stuff that's in the ponds and streams. Um, and as they metamorphose, that tiny little mouth in the front actually changes to be the giant mouth that you'd find in, in a typical frog, right? So they're actually, their, their jaws and their mouth go from being really tiny to really big. And that's associated with, you know, as they're little, as they're tadpoles, they're eating Essentially, I always think of that as kids. It's like if you were little and you basically grew up eating broccoli and only vegetables, and then when you hit you know, puberty and you're in high school, all of a sudden you're just eating meat, right? So adult frogs are all carnivores, almost exclusively all adult frogs are eating insects, they're eating mammals, they're eating whatever they'll fit in their mouth. But when they're tadpoles, they're actually eating the, the sort of quote, primary productivity. They're eating algae, they're eating leaves, things that are falling apart. Um, in the, in the water. It was an interesting transition. And because of that, because some of that stuff is really takes a lot of time to digest that they're eating as tadpoles, they have these really long stomachs and guts. And so if you've ever flipped over a tadpole and looked at its belly, you'll see this long spiral. And that spiral is its gut, right? And so it's taking a really long time to digest that stuff that's inside their stomachs. All right, let's move on to another bit of frog biology. So here is Diana the Huntress. So this is a, a also modeled a famous scout sculpture of the uh, of Diana. So you'll see here that it's got a bow and arrow. Now it turns out I could do this two different ways. We could talk about how frogs capture food. I thought that was a little less fun. Or we could talk about frogs fighting. <laughs> so we went the frog fighting route here. And it turns out that frogs actually, many frog species have really interesting lives. Um, these are examples of male frogs fighting. Uh, they'll fight for territories. Right, there's some bullfrogs on the on the left that are uh, wrestling in the water. Um, they'll they'll basically um, they'll fight for territories where you know they're advertising for female frogs to come to them to mate and to lay eggs. And on the right, you'll see multiple male toads all competing. Um, you know, for this female, this poor female toad that's on the bottom has these all of these males piling on top of her. And I'm going to show you just a little video clip um, because while frogs actually don't really fight uh, with bows and arrows and things, they actually can fight with other parts of their body. So this is actually a little clip from uh, David Attenborough's Life in Cold Blood. So these are, these are frogs the top, the that are found in uh, Central Africa, where I work. But he's late to the party. You, can find, you can find these scenes all the time. These are beautiful little reed frogs. These are all boys. They inflate their throat while they're calling. The further his voice will carry. And you start seeing that the way in which these little male frogs actually fight with each other is with their legs. And they do their best to actually kick each other off of these little pieces of grass where they're advertising, trying to make themselves known to female frogs. And these are actually the same uh, grasses where they actually lay their eggs and they attach their eggs to these grasses and it falls down to the pond. So think of them as sort of competing for the prime spots to lay their eggs. They'll wrestle like this pretty much all night. All right. Um, so another important aspect of frogs that often goes overlooked is, um, is care. So many frogs can be really caring. And while there is not a lot of frogs that garden like this, um, there's also there's many um, moms and dad frogs that really do spend a lot of time caring for their babies. Um, and important to that, uh, sort of inspired by this sculpture, is actually keeping their, their babies wet. 
right? Because if a baby frog or a tadpole dries out, it will die. So um, maintaining that balance of water in their body is really important for a frog. And so one of the aspects of caring parents in, uh, in amphibians and especially frogs is finding different ways of keeping the babies nearby and keeping them wet so that they don't dry out. So there's some weird examples about this, but they're, they're kind of fun. fun. Fun slash gross, which is always one of my favorite parts in herpetology. So on the left, this is a Suriname toad from the Amazon. This is a mom frog and all those little eggs are kind of stuck into her back. Um, and this is a, a, a frog that lives in the water. And so she carries all of these babies around with her in her back to protect them uh, and also to keep them wet. And when they are born, they hatch out of those little eggs and they swim away. On the right is a totally different type of frog. Um, this is a frog that unfortunately is believed to be extinct um, due to a combination of disease and climate change. This frog on the right was really remarkable because what happens is after the eggs are fertilized, the mom will swallow them and they lived in her stomach. Several baby frogs grew in her stomach and then when they were ready to be born, they were burped up, right? And they were kept in this really wet environment and protected by mom, but there she was carrying them around inside of her during which time she didn't eat, she didn't digest them and things like that. It was a really remarkable adaptation. Another example is dads do it too. So the, among the most famous um, historically has been the midwife toads. These are found in uh, Southwestern Europe and Spain, for instance. Uh, so this is a dad, he's wrapped all of these, uh, these egg strands around his hind limbs and then he carries them around as he hops in and out of uh, water and ponds there. And on the right is a truly remarkable one, kind of like that frog from Australia I just showed. This is a uh, what's called a Darwin's frog from Chile. And you'll see that it, under, its, under its head is a sort of giant brown pouch. So this is a dad Darwin's frog. And the reason that pouch looks like underneath his throat is, is so big is because he's actually carrying around developing tadpoles inside the sack that frogs use to actually make noise, right? So we saw that little video where there are the frogs that were inflating their throats to, to make noise as they're doing their advertisement calls. In, some, in two different species of Darwin's frogs, they actually swallow them and the tadpoles live inside of there until it's safe to come out and then they metamorphose and he burps them out. Which is truly weird and wild, but a great reason to study frogs because you discover all of these type of strange things. Um, last, I'm just gonna close with this. This is another uh, a fun example from um, the sculptures. This is Zenny, the meditating frog. I picked this one to close on because I kind of felt like <laughs> Uh, many of us are stuck at home and uh, now trying to figure out uh, sort of the things that we can do to uh, sort of maintain our sanity uh, at our houses. Um, and, you know, for me, I showed my lab earlier, the Legos. This is what my lab looks like this day. We're pretty much all spending our time on video conferences like this. And so one of the ways that's a great example to get out in the world right now is to join things like this. So later this week, um, there is something called the City Nature Challenge um, that's happening really around the United States. Um, and there's a website here, citynaturechallenge.org, you can look at. This uses the website iNaturalist to go out in the world, use phones, use your cameras if you want, record the things that are in your backyard and your neighborhood and share them with people. It's a great, a great opportunity for getting out, thinking about you know, the world around you that's in your backyard, which may or not may or may not include frogs, depending on where you are. In my backyard, there's probably seven different species of frogs that happen to live in this part of Gainesville, Florida. Um, so it is a great opportunity to get out and think about the world around you and share it with other people. And at last, I will uh, leave it at that for questions. Dr. Blackburn, thank you so much. And I wanna remind everybody, whether you're watching on YouTube to type in a comment or you're watching in Zoom, please in the chat box, please write your questions. Dr. Blackburn, we're gonna start with Nikita. She asks, are any frogs both poisonous and deadly? If so, can you name one or two? Uh, sure, there are definitely frogs that are uh, poisonous. Uh, so, you know, for instance, uh, toads is, is a common example. So behind the head of a toad, you'll see these big ball-like things back behind their ears. Those are glands that actually will secrete out the sort of white stuff. It'll taste really bad. You don't want to get it in your eyes. Um, there are uh, other frogs in the world, including things probably most famous, uh, the poison dart frogs. Um, these frogs do have toxins in their skin. They actually, a lot of frogs get these things from actually from eating insects. And the insects themselves are who make 
a lot of these toxins. And then the frog actually kind of steals them when it eats them and then puts it in the glands on their body. And so they taste really bad. Um, they can be really uh, irritating if you get them in your eye, for instance. Um, well, the vast majority of frogs in the world, you can catch by hand and it's totally fine. I would always though advise people to wash their hands after they do so. There's very, very few frogs that are truly deadly. And so their most famous are a couple bright yellow dart frogs. Um, from parts of, say, Colombia and northern South America. Um, these are frogs that actually are very toxic. But again, in captivity, uh, because they're not necessarily eating all of the prey that you would get in the wild there, a lot of frogs that are brought into captivity, including dart frogs, lose their toxicity. They're not as poisonous when they're actually in, you know, aquaria and zoos because they're not eating the same things as they would be in the wild. Bruce asks, were there ever giant frogs in the fossil record? Bruce. Uh, yes. So interestingly, there, there is an example of a very large frog in the fossil record. Um, so the biggest frog today is probably, you know, its body length is like this. With its legs, it's like this long. Um, so its head, its head is probably about that big. So not huge, but pretty big. There is an example of a fossil frog from Madagascar that's head probably would have been even bigger, about this big. Um, that is a fossil frog called Beelzebufo um, that was from the Cretaceous of Madagascar. And, and at least some of the art for the frog is often shown eating dinosaurs, although there is no real evidence that it ate small dinosaurs. Marion asks, how quickly do they name newly found frogs? And what is that process like? Ah. So um, there's a couple different ways to answer this. So we, we describe as a global community of people that study this, including my lab, because we describe new species. Um, as a global community, we probably describe on average somewhere between three and four new species every week, typically, which is really remarkable. Um, however, it can be a slow process. Sometimes there's things that you know, somebody found 100 years ago um, and it just took a hundred years for the right specialist, someone like me, to come along and say, well, that's not what that is. That's, that's totally different. Sometimes we make the Hi everyone, it looks like we're experiencing a little bit of technical difficulties on Dr. Blackburn's side of things. Please give us a second and we will troubleshoot with him. Thank you again for your patience. Hi everyone, we're not sure what happened to Dr. Blackburn, but we are going to stop here for a moment. I'm gonna ask that you do a couple of things so that we can get questions that were in the chat box and questions you still might have answered. Um, first of all, we wanna thank you. We wanna thank Dr. Blackburn for taking time to talk about Ribbit the Exhibit and Frogs with us to be our tour guide today. Um, I hope you've learned a lot so far and we want you to know that we have many programs like this that are readily available for you to see, including an upcoming um, visit on Wicked Plant with Mounts Botanical Gardens. 
and that will be on May 5th at 10 a.m. Um, you can find more information out about Dr. Blackburn, about uh, scientists in every Florida school, as well as Mounts Botanical Gardens. This is recorded and it will be featured on YouTube on the UF Earth Systems uh, YouTube channel, as well as on Facebook and the Scientists in Every Florida School webpage. So you can find the recording there along with additional events that are up and coming. Um, thank you. The questions will be posted with Dr. Blackburn's answers on those sites as well. Uh, additional resources for frogs can be found uh, in those spots in, as well too. So thank you again very much and hope you have a great day. Thanks, bye-bye.